Good evening, friends. Uh, this is Dr. Kavi Sadana from Delhi, and my talk today is approach to reticulate pigmentary disorders, which is uh, uh, you know definitely a complicated topic, but I'll try to make it simple for you. Okay, right. So let's first begin with the first slide and tell you what is the meaning of reticulate. Reticulate has got two basic meanings. One is a net-like appearance, which you see on the left side. But what is more you know, useful to understand is from uh, biology where you have a reticulate pattern on leaves. So this is the kind of pattern that we would be referring to. But of course, in my talk, I would have combined two terms, reticulate and discrematosis. So just to give you an idea, look at this particular slide. On the left side is a reticulate pattern. What you see on the right side is a pattern of pigmentation on the body, which looks like a net. Now. Another term that I have combined in my lecture today is this chromatosis. Now, this is, of course, classical reticulate pigmentation. Where you see uh, a net-like pattern on the extremities of this particular patient. Now, look at this particular patient. This patient has got lesions which are hypo and hyper. So when you have an admixture of freckle-like pigmentation that is both hyper and hypo, that is known as this chromatosis. So I've clubbed the two in my talk make it more uh, you know, all-encompassing. Of course, I'll be focusing only on genetic disorders. Now, for the approach to diagnosis, uh, there are various approaches, but the one that I have always give you an overview of the, of the disorder, and then of course, focus on a few important common conditions. The first thing that you should look at is inheritance. Now, in inheritance, uh, most of the disorders are autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, except a few uh, X-linked recessive, uh, X-linked disorders, including dyskeratosis congenita and, of course, X-linked reticular pigment disorder. The second thing that you should look at is, uh, of course, the age of onset. Usually, it's in the infancy or early childhood. So, I mean, even if you look at congenital disorders, anything less than two years onset is congenital. So, most of them are in that particular age group, except dowling degos that occurs at a later age group. The third thing, of course, is systemic involvement, uh, very crucial, very important because some of the disorders have got involvement of other organs, for example, discomatosis, symmetric variety area has got CNS involvement, even eye involvement, and discretus congenita has got uh, bone marrow involvement and even cancer. So this is important to know. Some of the disorders may have systemic manifestations. Then of course, we have hair, nail, teeth, teeth. Very interestingly, some of these disorders affect these three uh, uh, you know, structures, which makes it very simple to diagnose them. Classic example, of course, is dermatopathia, pigmentosa reticularis, and a host of other overlap conditions with overlap with ectodermal dysplasia. The next thing you should look at, of course, is involvement of palm and soles. Uh, quite a few of them have got actual involvement, uh, and, you know, some of them are localized just there. Uh, so again, the ketomera variant of acropigmentation and, of course, this process metric idea. Then, of course, you have uh, the last thing that is unusual thing, like maybe you know, patients who've got uh, sweating associated uh, defects or who have bully appearing. So that's, of course, uh, classically EBS with bottle pigmentation, which I know uh, nowadays it's probably not diagnosed morphologically, but it's good to know a morphological term for it. Now, uh, so what classification would I would I would I use? You know, we published a paper a review article in the IGD a few years back, and this is a classification that I find very useful. It's called the regional distribution of these disorders. So there are four regions: generalized, acral, treasural, and facial. And the generalized again, we have two categories: reticulate and discrematosis. In the true disorders of which are reticulate, you have of course the SARS one discrematosis. SASH1 is basically a gene defect, so and not easy to diagnose clinically. These patients usually have lentigens on their face and stomatosis on the body. Of course, dermatopathy are pigmentosa tribalis, which I'll show a few slides of that. Discaritis congenita, X-linked reticulate pigment disorder, which is basically has MLI deposition, and of course, the neglacy Francis Jarrison syndrome, which is called bullying. Now, those conditions that are generalized with discrematosis, that is hyper and hypo, uh, we have three or four conditions. One is discrematosis unisalis hereditaria, and of course, the acral variant of that, EBS with model pigmentation, and again, discreatosis congenita. 
In the acral variant, which is very commonly seen probably, is acral pigmentation of Kitamura. Uh, Dohi is actually uh, another name for discomatosis symmetrica hetaria. And the Cantu syndrome. In the fracture, we have Dolomitigos, and it's variant, the Gary Dagger disease, which is basically a, a catholic variant. And in the facial, of course, we have Haber syndrome, and again, the NMJ syndrome. So I think this is the most useful way of looking at these disorders and you know, one tends to diagnose them very easily with this particular classification. So now I'm going to run you through some photographs and you know, give you a you know a glimpse of what you may be able to see in clinical practice. Uh, classic case of uh, discomatosis in uh, given by my colleague Dr. Ananda Khana, and see this pigmentation. There's fact-like pigmentation all over the body, hyper and hypo. Yeah, this is this is of course uh, a condition which has got two gene defects, SARS1 and ABCB6 gene, which explains the melanosome transfer defect. It also explains why they have hyper and hypo. Uh, usually they are benign, uh, of no great consequence, but some of them actually have uh, involvement of the CNS and I. Uh, reasonably common, uh, described in Japanese, but we see we see it even in our country. Then of course we have. Uh, this condition, uh, you see the pigmentation is localized to the fragile areas, and you will notice a few epidermoid cysts, and you'll have these very classical comedon like lesions on the neck. So, this is, of course, a classic case of Dowling Dicos. There are two genes described uh, for this defect autosomal dominant. The most interesting part, apart from the fragile localization, is the classical comedon like lesions. And uh, there are also periodic period scars. They has they describe a classical pigmentation in a biopsy called anti-type pigmentation. So fairly simple condition, uh, easy to diagnose, uh, and doesn't have too many complications. This, of course, uh, not my case. It's a very interesting uh, and a very classical photograph of a pigmentary disorder. Just just imagine this patient has got a retrograde disorder in the body, and look at the patient's face. You have uh, upswept hair and a flared eyebrow, and with, of course, pigmentation of the body. And that's, yes, that's uh, excellent reticulate pigment disorder. It's, it's an unusual case report where they found a jack inhibition defect. Um, very interesting. So, this particular disorder, you know, is important to diagnose. In the, it's got a very classical morphology. In females, you just see lesions on the lines of Blaschko, uh, biopsy would show amyloid. And this is a condition that. Has got complications, and that is one of the reasons why you should diagnose it. Coronal opacification, GI inflammation, and a host of other things. So important to diagnose this early, especially in males where it's very obviously seen. Another condition, uh, now here you have pigmentation of the palms and the body. You have uh, uh, non secretion alopecia. If you see the slide on top, you have a, a loss of demerit lifix on one of the Thumbs, and of course, you have nail defects. This particular conglomeration is, yes, seen classically in dermatopathia, pigmentosopathia, and also in NFJ syndrome. Now, they, re, they usually overlap, but the classical dermatopathia is, is autosomal dominant, uh, get in 5 4 defect, and it's considered by a lot of people as just an ectomal dysplasia. Classical features are seen in most of these patients, this combination of uh, hair, nail, and hematologic defects, and uh, some of them have got PPK and they, they usually overlap with NFJ syndrome, which probably is maybe just a variant. Uh, important to know, um, especially because of the hypohidrosis and the dentitional defects, otherwise not many complications of this condition. Another disorder where you have, again, pigmentation, uh, oral involvement, you can see the lipoplakic pigment plaques, you have uh, tracheonychia, geographical tongue, yeah, that's the case of uh, Combination of oral lipoplakia, geographical tongue, and dyspartic nail. That's a discrete osteocognita for you. This is something which you must diagnose good and well in time because these patients get into complications really badly. Most of them have marrow failure by the second or third decade, and there's a risk, high risk of SEC, cancers, uh, hematopoietic uh, malignancies, and lacrimal duct ecclesia. So these patients actually may be diagnosed by a dentist or an ophthalmologist and then refer to you, and it's important to know this particular disorder for its complications. Another case, um, so here is a patient who's got reticulate uh, pigmentation, which you cannot make out, but what's pronounced is hyperkeratotic papules on non-fragile areas. 
This, of course, is a published case where the patient got astatin with very good results. This is a, a, a variant, um, considered to be a variant of Jalan Bigos and uh, called Gali Gali disease. Of course, this is a very simple condition seen very often in most uh, tertiary referral centers. Um, Acrylic pigmentation, reticulate, and pits on the palms. That's ketamala for you. All right, nothing great in that. Uh, now come to, of course, management. Now, management of the disorder, these disorders is actually very tricky because, you know, the first step of course is diagnosis. Most of us do not have a gene defect analysis laboratory. But if you suspect um, these disorders, you should look at systemic screen properly. A cancer screen is useful for certain disorders, uh, like, for example, discarious pinnonita. The treatment of this, these disorders is very difficult, actually. People have used extensions of melasma therapy, topical agents like hydroquinone, retinoids, acetic acid, with you know certain variable results. People have tried lasers, the few stress period. But I guess the most important thing ultimately is counseling. So I'll come to the one uh, thing which is you know uh, very hot in conferences. Now, there's this famous uh, you know law of the instrument that is that if you have a hammer, everything that is around you looks like a nail. This is a cognitive bias in, in which basically uh, you try to use whatever technique you have to treat a disorder. Classically, lasers. So lasers, you know, if you go to conferences, you have uh, some of the best results. They say the joke is, is seen in conferences. So can lasers be used in these uh, disorders? So to understand that, uh, you know, this is a book that we have written in the second edition. And I'll give you three principles of laser therapy which you will not find in many other books, which I have learned by you know, experience over the years. Number one, static and dynamic disorders. Like a static disorders are easy to treat. For example, lead digits. For example, uh, melasma on the other hand is dynamic. A patient has you know, episodic melasma and gets worse with certain factors. So never expect great results with melasma, but you get great results with lead digits. Similarly, you have epidermal and dermal disorders. The epidermal disorders are easy to treat, and dermal disorders are difficult to treat. So, lentigens are easy to treat because the epidermal and the dermal disorders, like mucosa water, are very difficult to treat. Uh, Ochronosis, uh, things like that. In fact, the joke is that <clears throat> the best water results are seen only in conference talks. And the last thing, the most important thing, is skin of color. You know, our skin types, if you overdo your NDI lasers, you cause thermal damage and EDP to PIX. So you have to use these three principles and apply them to these disorders. And suddenly you find that the only condition that you can treat uh, sufficiently well is Kitamura. Kitamura is something you can try and the rest it's tiresome. So I'll give you an example of one particular case. This is a patient uh, who came to us, a uh, child with dyschromatosis, human salus hereditaria, and of course, uh, my PG said, I'm let's try places. I said, go ahead. So we use 500 nanometers because we were targeting the, the pigmented part, not the hypo. Uh, the settings depend on the endpoints, what you see, what is light, the whitening. And now just see how laborious it is. You know, you have a probe size. Even if you increase your probe size, you can't go to 510 mm because you'll be unnecessarily hitting the normal skin. So you have to go to 2 mm. That is settings there with the aiming beam. And look at the look at the laborious extend, you got to keep on targeting each of these pigmented lesions. It's highly laborious. And uh, so I told my resident, go ahead, do it. And I think by the third setting, we lost interest. So the thumb rule is don't unnecessarily force a treatment. So when patient comes to me and asks me in the end of the whole story, diagnose a disorder and feel very happy about it, and the patient comes back and says, now what? So, you know, uh, <clears throat> there's a very famous adage which you should use uh, for certain disorders like this and that is this. It is not necessary that every problem has a solution. You have to learn to live with some problems and rather than forcing a solution like lasers and doing a blunder. So, you know, uh, philosophically speaking, you know, uh, uh, people have solutions for your problems and not their own. But more importantly, for this spectrum of disorders, it makes sense to diagnose, advise, counsel, look for complications and well, yeah, right, live with it. So that was my last slide. Uh, thank you very much for patient hearing and thank you for the Academy and the uh, SIG group for calling me over for this talk. And thank, thanks to Dr. Raul Marjan for the great invite. Thank you so much and a good day.